We're live. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, I thought we might start. The last time we saw you was at the World Championships where clearly you got injured. Um, how, how is that injury? Uh, I am getting close. I'm getting close to better. Uh, you know, I didn't know what was wrong at the time. I just knew I I was struggling with my back and, and spasms and hurting and um, not able to really in any way be myself, couldn't run like myself, couldn't push sleds like myself, couldn't really do anything. Um, and uh, at this point, um, I am mostly healed on what turned out to be a stress fracture in my L2 uh, vertebrae. So wow, that, that explains a lot. <laughs> you, uh, you battled through it well, to be fair, in, in the race itself, in the elite race itself. like It must have been because you were struggling for it early early on, weren't you, really? Um, yeah, I, I felt it on the opening run. And then uh, on the second run, I know it, my back started really seizing up. And uh, essentially, I think what was happening is uh, my back was saying, stop. <laughs> and uh, like, stop pushing this. It's broken um but um and so it would just seize up to try and just basically debil debilitate me to the point where i would stop and i you know refused to stop for so many weeks while it was already in that state yeah. and uh you know you kind of you kind of go as hard as you can at the sled push i i pushed about 10 seconds and i knew that the race was over for me yeah. like in terms of like you know, chance of, of being competitive was, it was gone. Yeah. Um, I, I never really, I envisioned that I would uh, do anything but finish last at that point, but I really, I really wanted to finish. Like it was really important to me to, you know, I, I had not been able to get into the elite 15 the year before to a number of issues. I wasn't really racing my, you know, my wife had been really pregnant, had the baby. I missed the New York race and I didn't have like any opportunities to really, qualify so i took one swing at london on that huge course and, and missed qualifying by a few seconds through a mistake of my own I, I ran past the wall ball station and um i missed running in that race uh world championships the year before and i knew like even hurt like I, it, it meant a lot to me to just be able to go and line up and and run this race and um swallow my pride and i think i knew in all likelihood i was probably going to finish last uh going in but uh, there was a hope that maybe the body would just like cooperate for one hour and it, it did it and that's okay. Um, and it's been a really grueling rehab for me, um, physical therapy and um, a lot of dry needling, a lot of cupping, a lot of stretching, a lot of, you know, took out all the high intensity running, took out all the hard, heavy lifting, took out a lot and just spent a lot of time on the bike, on the assault bike, on the skier, on the rower um, gradually incorporating more and more of those things and um, gradually rebuilding my my engine um, to the point that I'm feeling reasonably confident in my abilities going into I know, the first big race of the year. That's good. I, th I think about that sometimes because like we'll, we'll maybe get into it, but when you won the North American Championships, and I knew you'd been injured prior to that, like throughout the summer. And then essentially came back and managed to win that. And I find that like when I get like a niggle or, or an injury and like immediately, like it feels like the end of the world and you're going to lose all your fitness and everything like that. But then I, I sometimes think of you because like you managed to train around, uh, I think you had another stress fracture at the time, right? For, throughout the yes. summer, yeah. you managed to train sure. around that and come back and win the North American championships. Um, is it is it just the case of like when you can't run is time on the assault bike, time on time on the ergs? Is that, is that what it is? I mean, that's a big part of it. I mean, what can you do to continue to progress? Like, can you get better at other things while you allow your brittle bones to recover or whatever it might be? Um, for me, it, it came down to like, you know, reminding myself constantly, like you focus on what you can do and not on what you can't do. And with the shin injury, it was, you know, it just hurt, but I could do things pretty hard. I could, I couldn't run, but I could assault bike as hard as I wanted to. I could row hard. I could ski hard. Um, I could get on the road bike and ride for four hours and that was all fine. 
with the back, this is a like kind of a unique thing where like I couldn't even put out power on the assault bike for a couple months. Like I if I did anything more than just very light basic pedaling, I was in like horrific pain. And um, you know, there's so many nerve endings in your back. It's just um this is a level of pain that I I haven't been exposed to previously. And this is this is this is a big level up from racing a couple of high rocks races on a stress fractured shin. Like that's one thing. And that's, you know, it hurts, but you can suck it up. You know, even if it makes you want to vomit, you can do it. The back, it's just like, if it tells you no, it's just no. And so um, I couldn't row for a while. I couldn't really, I could run slowly. That was the weird thing. I could run as long as it wasn't intense. I could do it as long as there wasn't like a tremendous amount of, foot to ground force or speed or significant extension by opening my stride. I could run like, you know, uh, you know, seven minute mile, seven thirty mile pace or, you know, without having too many problems. But if I went into that, like six minute mile pace, six thirty, that was already like no good. And then for me, when I race, I want to be closer to that five thirty mile pace. So it, that was a, that was definitely not happening. It wasn't happening in training. And so you have to kind of, accept that and just say, what, what can I do? I can do a lot of steady state. I can just go back to building a base. It's off season, build a base. I don't like resting in terms of like, I don't like taking long periods of time off. Um, but you can continue to strengthen your aerobic <clears throat> base. You can continue to strengthen your heart. You can continue to strengthen your legs. Like I couldn't heavy lunge. I couldn't squat. I couldn't deadlift. So how can I get stronger without doing those things. And I couldn't put heavy resistance on the bike and press down on the pedals. Cause that was too hard on my back. So, um, it was just a lot of grinding, slow grinding. Wow. Okay. Um, if we, can we just, uh, talk a bit about your background uh, to get to the levels of fitness you're at at the moment, what was, what were you doing growing up? Um, sure. yeah, what, where, where were you focused sports wise? I was originally soccer player, swimmer. Um, those are my childhood sports and I swam every summer. Soccer was my main sport. I played a ton. And then um, I won my first race in fourth grade and got really interested in running by sixth grade. I was, I won, I won my first 5k in fifth grade. I won my first 10k in sixth grade. So I'm, you know, 10, 11 years old. And I was um, really interested in, in running at that point. I started training with the varsity uh, athletes at my school, which was six through 12. So I was 11 years old running with 17 year olds and, you know, running like 30, 35, 40 miles a week with them. And, wow. um, you know, it, it just became one of these things where, um, th running became my love and it was like kind of your identity when you're a kid and you don't, you don't have a lot else. And, uh, I gave up soccer for it to focus on it. And, um, I then got really into wrestling in high school. I, I was captain of my wrestling team and, um, it's a sport I really love and respect. And when I see it, you know, get dropped from the Olympics and stuff like that, it, it, one of those people that it gets real fired up about that, um, yeah. as one of the original five Olympic sports, it needs to be there. <laughs> um, but that, you know, that running background, that, that wrestling background, the swimming background, all these individual sports. Like I played team sports too. I played, I played basketball. I played soccer. Um, I played baseball, which I didn't really love. Um, but the individual sports really drew me in because I love the idea of being able to control my own destiny and like win or lose. This was on me. Was I prepared? Did I do the little things that mattered? There's no one to blame, but you, um, you know, you had a good day. You had a bad day break it down. What did you do wrong? Did you train hard enough? Did someone train harder than you? Did they fight harder than you? Um, and some of it's bad luck and good luck. And, you know, you always need good luck to win something big, but um, yeah, I was drawn into those sports. And then when I got to college, I was running um, and I had a bad coach. I kind of fell out of love with it. I ended up joining the American football team and bulking up. So I went from this like string bean runner running 80, 90 miles a week, a hundred miles a week to uh, no running, all power lifting, eating, you know, 8,000 calories a day and wow. just <laughs> getting massive. And I bulked up to, from, from the end of my senior year of high school, where I was 142 pounds, 
by the end of my freshman year of college, one year later, I was 208 pounds. And so you're almost a hundred kilos, you know, like, what is that? Like 96 kilos or something. Um, and so 95, I don't know. It's big, it's big boy. Um, and so for me, it, it was like, and then finding this balance, like I'd incorporated all the strength training in and for years I didn't run, I wasn't interested in it. And then I discovered it through, through, um, Spartan race, actually, that was kind of like what reinvigorated my love of running, my interest in it. I started running marathons and stuff too on the side. I've run a few, some ultras, and then High Rocks kind of came in 2021, kind of out of the blue. Um, uh, Hunter, Hunter called me and kind of invited me to run in the High Rocks Invitational. He was like, you know, I don't think anybody here can beat me, but maybe you can. And, um, that, that got me fired up and I started training really hard for it and got really excited about it. And then, uh, he rescinded the invitation. I think once he saw the the times I was putting down in a lot of my training, but he says it was, uh, to, to add more influential people to the mix, uh, to try. <laughs> um, so anyway, I just kind of just started, you know, talking some trash, just trying to get into that race. And then, you know, uh, he beat me there. I finished second. The rest is history. I just kind of got hooked on the sport and uh, I've been loving it ever since, you know, it's been a really fun thing. You know, I own a gym. I coach people. It's called elevate. It's in Washington, DC. And, um, now, you know, I coach hundreds of athletes, but I coach specifically, a, a, a few dozen who focus very specifically on high rocks. And it's just, it's a blast, man. I absolutely love coaching people for this because you really get to push people. You get to train so many disciplines and so many different elements of sport. And the training is just always fun. It's a grind. It's hard, but it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. And think, thinking about like your, your, your childhood and growing up and where you're at sporting wise now, uh, like I know you've got your daughter's one, is she? Yeah. She's actually 19 months now. Yeah. Okay. It's crazy. Okay. Are you, are you, are you thinking about that at all? Like for her sporting wise, you're going to try and guide her in a certain direction or anything like that? You know, we talk about this. Like I, I would love for her to run and be interested in fitness. And I think soccer would be probably the best sport for her to play proper football because um, she, you know, I think she'll have a, a knack for it. I was, I was a fairly good player by American standards. Uh, my wife was as well. Um, both of us probably could have played in college, but both of us ended up running in college. And so, um, you know, you often you have to choose. And for my daughter, I mean, I think it would be the most fun for her to play soccer and then get to running, but we don't want to force that on her. Like, I think you see so many kids, their parents burn them out on this and I want her to want it for the right reasons. So she loves it. Like we've loved it for a lifetime. Running has given me so much over my lifetime. Um, and I still can go out and go for a 10 mile run and just feel good yeah. the whole time. And just like, it just like brings you joy and peace. And like, that's a wonderful thing that I would, I don't want to push it so hard on her that she loses that. Um, and if she doesn't want to play sports, man, that's a huge loss for us, but let's, you know, I think that's, that's everybody's needs to have like kind of their own journey in life and that could be hers, you know, whatever that might be. Yeah. Yeah. How has it been from a like just a, a managing your you, you mentioned you run a gym, you've got a 19 month old daughter trying to train like an elite athlete. Has that been hard managing all of that? Yeah. I mean, I think they, they say you you make time for the things that matter to you. Um, for those at home who struggle with kids and work and training and whatever, I, I typically say train in the morning because the day has a way of taking away your free time at the end of the day, like things come up. So if you can train in the morning, train in the morning. So I, I often coach my first class by 5.30 a.m. or 6 a.m. I'm coaching. So I will typically get into the gym 45 minutes before that to get my first session in. Um, and just, this I call them my mini workouts and they will be 20 to 30 minutes usually of just like cranking hard, high intensity or heavier weight or uh, some kind of Metcon or I like to just get something in. And then typically as soon as I'm done coaching, so let's say I coach 6 a.m., uh, I would coach 6, 7, 8, and then at 9 o'clock, I'll immediately go into a workout. Yesterday, for example, 
I just did a full high rock simulation. I basically like, <laughs> finished coaching, just rolled out the sleds and just did it alone. Um, not in silence. Cause that would be psychotic, <laughs> but, um, but you know, like sometimes you just have to just, I needed to, to know like if my body could handle it before I <laughs> left Chicago. How was it? It went pretty good. It went pretty good. It was, uh, I would say a big like confidence booster for me. Um, I have very specific like, benchmarks that I want to hit when I do these workouts. And um, I set a goal for the day, uh, like a very like conservative, reasonable goal. And I hit it and then some. And so I was uh, very pleased. But the biggest goal was just like, can I do this without my back like seizing up? And that's been a big like fear and apprehension thing for me because um, when I've done very hard running and very hard stuff combined with sleds, that's been when the back has like seized the most. And so to get through that was like a really big confidence builder. Nice. Nice. Um, I, I briefly mentioned your, your North American championship win earlier. Um, like two questions on that really, like, was that, uh, presumably that was a fantastic experience for you. Um, and then also I'm interested to know, like only a few weeks prior, you'd, come and done the European championships and finished, look, I'm not sure where it was, ninth, Eight. you know, it was, Eight. okay. Yeah. It was quite a significant like difference in a, in a few weeks. What, what did you put that down to? Well, I think one thing is, I think it can't be discounted. It is very difficult to fly to another continent and adjust, be out of your routine, eating different food, sleeping in a different bed, sleeping on a different sleep schedule, eating, you know, not the normal things, not training in your normal capacities and your normal routines and then on so i just i never i did not feel great in that race um but i would say it came down to a couple other things one was race strategy i went out too aggressively i got sucked into the race in a way it was very undisciplined of me it was very unlike me um but i went into that race very confident in my fitness and thought that i could just mash everybody to bits and like win that way which was just if I had run my own race, I think things would have come out differently. And I ended up um, encountering a lot of back tightness, which has been a thing that has plagued me on and off for years. Um, but when I have really, my my back is tight, like my, I just can't open up my stride. I can't run like I would like to. And so uh, I was unable to be myself. And so um, that was the biggest thing that I would say was like, um, I felt like I beat myself that day. I just, I went out too hot. Um, it was a weird race in, in the standpoint of the opening run was like 500 meters. And then every other run was like 1170 or something huge. Um, so pacing it was odd. I overran a couple of the early runs. I got real hot. I overskied. I pushed the sled too hard. I did a few things that were just like uncharacteristic of me. And pacing it was a little weird because of the strange shape of the course. And, um, I paid the price for it. My, my strategy was to run faster than everyone else. And when the runs are that long, I think you, the return on it, 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 it I took some damage. And yeah. so I looked at myself, I, I assessed, how did I approach this race? Look at all the dumb things I did. <laughs> and I never doubted my fitness. If I could just get my back to cooperate and, um, and so I just went into Chicago thinking, just be yourself, be run smart, show everybody, you know, who you are. And then, you know, I assumed that the race would come back to me at like the sixth or seventh station. I did not expect the race to come back to me at the burpee broad jumps, where all of a sudden I came off the sled pole, ran 20 seconds faster than the guys up in front of me. And all of a sudden I was running into burpee broad jumps ahead of Ryan Kent. Like I didn't expect that to happen so quickly but once it did i knew when i left the sleds in third place i knew i was going to be on the podium already because i was like i feel amazing these guys are in my rear view like they're not going to be able to outrun me and um you just have days where you're like okay everything is like everything works everything feels good i'm running laps around i see my wife and my baby every lap like it's a really big like power boost I had a ton of athletes I was coaching there that were making a racket every time we came into the grid. Like it, it just, it, it just, um, you have good days and you just know it. Yeah. And by the time we got to the, we got off the rower 
I I figured I would win the race. I figured there Sandbatch was ahead of me, but I was gaining so much ground on every run that I just I knew that it was just a matter of just continuing to go and I was going to catch him at the lunges. That was that was what I figured, but then I caught him on the farmers carries actually. Dylan and I both caught him. And then the dude to his credit dug in and fought like hell again cuz he's he fights, man. He really fights. And, um, but I just felt confident that like I was going to have a good lunge that I was going to be the fastest of the three of us on the wall balls. And so all I needed was to come into those stations with those guys and I would win the race. Yeah. Yeah. Is that your best sporting experience ever? Would you say that race? I think so. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's, it's either that or like, you know, the New York marathon, which, you know, I'm never going to win that race. So <laughs> uh, I finished 84th in the New York marathon and That's... thought that was just an absolute highlight of my uh, athletic career. But um, no, this is this is probably number one. Nice. Um, you, you mentioned like traveling to a different country and the jet lag and the food and everything like that. Yeah. Um, would, would would you say you've learned anything from that? Like, obviously, it's always going to be difficult. Is there anything you'd do differently next time? And I'm asking that really because there's lots of people listening to this that will eventually travel to Nice for the World Champs or go abroad for a race or anything like that. Um, anything you've learned, you'd say? You know, I've learned a lot. I wouldn't say it works every time. Like, you can do everything right, and it's still just like a 15-hour plane ride can just – yeah. just wreck you for four days and there's just like no explanation or you could feel normal. Um, strangely enough, you know, like, like time on the ground always helps adjusting to the time zone, getting rehydrated, shaking out the jet lag, all that stuff. Right. And then at the same time, I flew to Stockholm last year and land, got to my hotel like 16 hours before my race. And <laughs> And somehow, and it wasn't a direct flight. It was like a, a 18 hour journey, hell journey. And, um, and somehow that was the best race I've run in Europe so far. And I didn't, wouldn't say I felt amazing during it by any means, but sometimes things just work and sometimes they don't. And I would tell people like, try to do the best you can to reestablish your routine, try and eat foods you like to eat, try and get a massive amount of sleep when you get there. And just sleep as much as you can run, make sure you're getting, you know, take a day of rest and then get some running in, try and get like, you got to that first time you work out after you fly, something like that is going to feel bad no matter what. And so you got to get that one out of the way. And then the, you know, the other thing is just go back to your routines, do a long mobility warm up, really focus on your hips, really focus on your back because those are the things that get punished on a long flight and sleep, sleep, sleep. Lots of sleep. Okay. Um, you uh, you talked about like your running mileage when you were younger, and obviously, it's, uh, I was going to ask you your running mileage now, but I guess it's it's been very limited. What where where do you think ideally in an ideal world it would be like when you're training for high rocks? I think. Um, well, I, you know, these things are cyclical. Like you know, when you have a base building phase, you're going to run a lot more mileage, and then when you're into more of a threshold development phase that mileage is going to come down and then when you're fine tuning it's going to come down even more um as you get into like a bit more machine work and things like that but um i used to only think about things from the standpoint of mileage because i came from that running background um now i think about it also from the standpoint of uh training volume as in like machine volume incorporated in as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like those numbers to be somewhere around like 10 hours a week mm -hmm. of, of volume between running and machine work, um, give or take. Um, but ideally, yeah, I'm running six hours a week maybe. And then the mileage wise, six to seven, I would say. And then mileage wise, you know, I like to be somewhere in the, 35 to 50 ish miles per week. And then when I'm really focusing on building my base, if I'm like pre prepping for like a marathon or something like that is extremely helpful for your high rocks base. Um, I would be more like 70 to 80, 85 miles per week, but that's about as high as I'll go. And that's only for a limited period of time. And more so more important than total mileage is the quality of your long runs. Whereas like if you're getting, 
like I went through a, a six week training block right after High Rocks World Champs in 2021. I was prepping for the New York Marathon. And I went from, I averaged about 50 miles a week for that year. But in that six weeks, I was in the 70 to 85 mile range. But I did every Tuesday, I called it my Tuesday 20. I did a 20 mile run every single Tuesday for six straight weeks. And on the peak week, I did a 20 mile run on Tuesday and a 20 and a 24 mile run on Friday that week. And those runs were at about 630 mile pace too. So like pretty good pace to go with them. Um, and those runs are needle movers. So I would tell people like more important than your total miles is make sure you get your long run. The other thing I would tell you is uh, at least every other week, get your threshold run. So you could, or a tempo run, like you can, you can run at the track, you can do your intervals. That's all great. And that's all very, very helpful work. But a run that is alternated every other week with your long run or in addition to it, that is four to seven, eight, 10 miles of harder running is going to move the needle a lot, especially if it's at like your high rocks race pace or faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, nice. And then like strength wise, like we've done a, 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 well, I've done a survey, surveying like you guys, the elites and talking about your strength and, and running numbers. And you're one of the stronger guys in the field. Like uh, we, you know, if we're talking deadlift and squat numbers, I think. Which is, which um, is funny. Cause I barely do it. I, I barely do it at all. <laughs> it's that, it's that year of eating 8,000 calories a day. It's stood mm -hmm. you in good stead forever. So where, where, are, where are you or where might you be if you were not, injured um on your squats and deadlifts you know what it's hard to say i never won rep max ever like really ever i definitely can pull 500 pounds on the deadlift um but it's funny because that's the lift i do the least i just for whatever reason i i i have like um really big meaty glutes and so <laughs> so so uh deadlift has always been a, a lift that i've been very good at but i never lift i never deadlift heavy it's just too hard on my back um and for the squat again i going really heavy has been tough on my back so i've been i mean i've loaded the bar up recently i was doing sets of five at 315 but i just felt like crap the next day um i probably could get to like three. 50. I don't know. I, I just don't lift that way. I'm, I'm actually focusing on, I I'm, um, I'm starting to work with a, an NFL strength and conditioning coach named Chris Gorris, who uh, he is, he's worked with some, he works with Lorenzo Alexander, who's a fascinating player. You should, you should Google him. He came into the NFL as a defensive tackle, like huge dude, 300 pound dude, and then couldn't find a role in the team in that capacity and switched to kick coverage and had to lose 40 pounds to become faster. And then he switched to fullback and had to learn how to play a totally different position and change his body again. And then he switched to linebacker and had to change his body completely again and um, ended up making a pro bowl. He's a fascinating guy, but Chris was his trainer through all of this. And Chris is um, we've been kind of brainstorming like what elements of training can improve can I improve upon to help with my racing and we're talking a lot about velocity training because you can lift heavy weights to generate force or you can lift weights fast to generate force and so because of my back and just how limited uh I don't I, I want to preserve it as much as possible uh, I'm actually really going to be emphasizing some velocity training over the next few months okay interesting so what do you know what that might look like yeah is it is it just deadlifts at a lighter weight, but focusing more on the on the speed. Uh, you guys will have to, have to wait and see. Okay, <laughs> okay. Tell us more after you win Chicago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Um. I was I was going to ask about about your training and your training over time in High Rocks. Have you aside from the velocity training? Is there anything else you've changed your mind on over the past couple of years? You know, any any mistakes you think you've made? Um, I was, well, a few things. I was I was doing a lot of simulations in the beginning. I wanted to feel it and feel it and feel it again. And 
you know, and kind of be at that point where I was like, we've been here a thousand times. Now I don't simulate quite as frequently. I throw a lot more workouts that are high rock specific workouts, but maybe they're um, only integrating two or three high rock skills as opposed to getting through everything one time, like repeating on them. Yeah. Um, I am definitely, I would say the biggest thing is just taking away some of the really heavy lifts and focusing more on specificity when it comes to things like lunging and sleds and things like that. Um, those would be the biggest changes. Okay. Okay. Um, mindset wise, uh, I, I talk with a lot of people in here about where their mind goes in the depths of a race and when things are really tough, where does, where does yours go? Um, I become a bit of a different person during the race than I am afterwards. I think most, most guys would tell you like, I'm pretty like jovial and friendly and like, uh, I'm like a big into the brotherhood of the sport. Like I think that we are all going through this shared experience that is really hard and really challenging and special. And like, I tremendously respect all of the guys that I race with and the work that they've put in. But during the race, um, I basically <laughs> look at everybody as inferior. Um, and so I, I, you know, if there's somebody running with me, I I kind of am like chuckling to myself about how much of a wuss they are or how I'm, you know, like I'm not going to give that person an inch because I don't think they've worked harder than me. I don't think they're stronger than me. I don't think they're faster than me. I don't think they're tougher than me. And um, that's a lot of where it comes from. But I also, that's when you're in a war with one person and you have to believe that you are the superior athlete in that situation. At the same time, like, my mindset is that I'm not really racing other people because I'm not running their race. I'm running my race. And if I'm running my race, that means that I'm really only racing my clock and my splits. And so whether someone is really with me at a certain point doesn't really matter. Like we don't get into nut crunching time until you're at like the farmer's carries and you're coming off that. And now you've got run into lunge and run into wall balls. Like that's the only time you're really racing someone. If you're being realistic about it before that, you're just setting the most sustainable, attainable tempo and pace for yourself. And whether someone is near you or not is really irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Okay. But say like, let's, let's talk, talk about whatever the, the end of that marathon that you ran. Oh. Uh, pre presumably that is getting tough. You're not trying to win. You're not competing. Does, does it get, are you, are you thinking about anything at that point? Yeah. A couple things. Um, that race in particular, I would say was very, very mental. Like I I'm a big believer in like having mantras, repeating them to yourselves, yourself. And my training partner, uh, Mark Gadet, who's an army ranger. Um, I still call him my training partner, even though he's lived in Colorado the last year and a half, uh, two years. He told me, before the race, he said, remember the age old army ranger saying DBAP, don't be a pussy, which <laughs> I repeated to myself over and over and over during this race when I was struggling. And I remember getting, I had a massive cramp in my hamstring and I ran and I just like was screaming and dragging this leg. And I just rammed my thumb into it and screamed, you know, right, right in front of a lot of people. Um, <laughs> And that was big uh, mentally. And then I think the rest of it, honestly, man, like I was my my daughter hadn't been born yet. But, you know, I knew my wife was expecting and I was running and I was looking at our my ring on my finger and I was thinking about my wife and I was thinking about my daughter and I wanted them to be proud of me. And so like that is like that is a big inspiration for me, like getting getting to have my my daughter there to when I won the U.S. championships. Like She won't remember it, but she was there and I'll get to tell her about that. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the kind of stuff, man. That's, that's real. When you become a parent, um, it's, it changes your motivation changes like a lot. It's a lot of it becomes like setting an example for yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And showing them like, like what you can do if you believe. And work. And work for it and fight for it. Mm -hmm. mm. Nice. Um, your, your, North American Championship win has effectively qualified you for the four majors this year in the new mm -hmm. elite setup at High Rocks. Um, I was going to ask you if 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 you like that elite setup. Presumably you do. Uh, what 
yeah, what, what, what do you think about what they've done with it? Well, over the summer, I, I made a number of proposals to them. Uh, I wanted the sport to be equitable. I wanted the sport to be in a place where time was less of a decider of who got to run in the big races, because I think course variance was out of control, is out of control. You know, whether it's Hong Kong or it's um, a race like Poland, which is the polar opposite, right? Like course variance is just, and sled variance was just too big a factor when, when slots were being decided by seconds. So I proposed a number of things, including and not limited to regional qualifying races. And those regional qualifiers would have X number of spots. And those that would determine how you got into the European championship, the North American championship, et cetera. And so you'd essentially be establishing majors and mid-majors. And they took the concept of majors and ran with it. Um, the I proposed legacy bids essentially where a champion could come in and get to defend their title. But I only proposed it that the North American champion got to run at the North American championships, the European champion at the European championships. Like if you were the defending champion of that particular race, you'd get to run in it. Now, High Rocks had a number of concerns. And one of them was to get as many of their known commodity names into as many big events as possible. So I recognize why they extended that to be all the majors. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't what I requested. I'm not going to complain about it, but it, it, um, it didn't solve the inequity problem that I was hoping to solve. Um, so I wanted to get that out on the table. Like I never requested this, but I will run as much as many races as I can because I have this opportunity. And, you know, my objective is still to expand the field to 20 or 25 racers, because as it grows around the world, I think you have more talent coming in. And what we've seen is that on any given day, you could finish 15th or first. So I think that it's important to have more representation in the sport at a greater depth. Um, so, so that's my big goal. And my other big goal is to get the sport to move to a place where time is completely a non-factor. And the qualifying to world championships is a great example of that. You must race your way in. And that is, that was something I was pushing hard for. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is going to be a big leap forward for the sport. I hope that we can continue to find good ways to make it uh, to improve upon it, but this was a great start. And now if we can extend that out to the majors, that would be great too. Yeah. yeah. Cause it, it, it looks, I mean, it's obviously very hard, but it's very hard to qualify or to break into that 15, isn't it? At that, the moment. That's still my concern. Like I, I, I think because they had to go, they didn't know what to do with, qualifying so few qualifiers in the united states so they just extended how long that window was to put down a time so now you have times from last year and the course variance factor is still just a problem and people are having a hard time it seems like the sleds have slowed down slowed down a little bit and now people are having a hard time breaking into that elite 15 yeah. mix and i want to see uh, a greater mix i think that what they really should do is have a regionals like elite 15 uh, Europe, Elite 15, United States, and Elite 15, uh, Pacific, and then bring the best 10 from each of those that qualify through it. They should be Elite 20 in each of those. And then the top 10 or the top five from each of these regions comes together for the world championships. Like we slowly create uh, regional circuits that I think will create more names and more stars and within their regions. And then you'll have a little bit of extra fun tribalism to go along with it. Like, I think the whole thing will become more exciting for fans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, 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 with, with the setup as it is though, and like you saying you want to run in the, the four majors and then presumably be the world championships as well. How are you thinking about like peaking, like, do do you feel like you can peak for each of those? Are you are you going to select one or two that you're going to try and peak for? Is is there an well, approach you thought about? Well, Chicago for me is more of like a test run because I just don't know what to expect from my body. I know that I'm not optimized, uh, but if I can get ninety percent of my peak, and then things break the right way for me, I'll be in the fight. Um, that's my hope, and. As far as the other races, I'm not running the Scandinavian major. I'm going to run the Deck World Championships instead. Not just, not out of preference, but out of, 
I have athletes that qualified that I'm coaching there. My wife qualified for elite in Deca Fit and for or Deca Fit teams, excuse me, and she qualified for in Deca Mile, I think, for her age group. So, like that's cool. I'm running with uh, Eric Williams, who coaches with me at, at Elevate. He's he and I are going to be teammates for all three of the team races. So, like it's a fun like experience for us to get to share this. Um, and but the other races I will be running, and um, so the European Championships, and of course the race in DC where I get to wake up in my own bed and run. <laughs> as long as I'm healthy, yeah, I'll run. And um, I think that right now, you know, if you're peaking for if you're peaking for European Championships, you're peaking for North American Championships too. It's three weeks apart, you know, so you just pop one race, rest a week train a week, rest a week, pop another race, you know, what else are you going to do? Um, but I think, I think three weeks between races is actually excellent. I think that's a really nice amount of time for your body to absorb that one race for you to think about what you did wrong for you to get back into a routine and then feel really good for your next one. So I like that. I think the harder thing is when you look at like the American race schedule and it's like, it's like three races in four weeks and then nothing for a while. And then like they'll do the same thing. Like it, I understand the the difficulties with logistics that they are facing. Um, you know, I was talking with Doug about it and he's like, dude, it costs us like $60,000 to ship everything from one city, like across the country. So like, we have to, we have to do like one city, then the next, it would just be really nice if the events were like three weeks apart and not one week apart. Um, especially the week prior to North American championships. Like it's really hard to run a race a week before a major. Yeah. So um, I get the struggle. Um, I think when we in the sport, when we race high rocks, we look at it and we say, oh, like I'm going to run this one, this one, and this one. But the, the, the primary consumers that they're going after, they believe only run one way race a year and it's their local race. So I, I don't know, like they said, 95% of those people. I don't know that I agree with that number. I think if they were to lean in a little harder on the, the hardcore consumer, they might find that we are willing to travel to four or five races a year and that we are also willing to, if given a scheduling opportunity, run an individual race and a doubles and a relay all in the same weekend if it were ske- possible based on schedule. Mm-hmm. That would mean, you know, they would sell fewer, they would have to sell fewer tickets to, well, fewer tickets to fewer people in order to sell the same number of tickets and they would achieve greater success with a lower, with a smaller audience. So I'm hoping that we can continue to drive that. Okay. Okay. Uh, And and I guess like going back to that discussion about like trying to break into the elites for those that are like trying to do that once every weekend for a few weeks in a row, it becomes, it it soon adds up onto the body, doesn't it? If you're constantly trying to do that. For sure. It would be really nice from like a training block perspective to be like, all right, I got this race and then I got six weeks to the next one. And then I got six, like that would be ideal for training. It's just not necessarily realistic from a logistical standpoint from high rocks. And I like, I feel for them because they're, that's a struggle, man. Like to please your, your hardcore consumers, like your, your superstar consumers who but also understanding that they're a small minority of your major audience. Yeah. You know, they always say like pro division is 3% of our sales. 3%. That's crazy to me because to me, when I look at high rocks, pro is the only thing that matters. <laughs> and obviously it isn't doubles is what matters. Yeah. 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 I'm doing, I'm doing Birmingham at the weekend and I noticed there's over a thousand doubles teams entered for the day. That's uh, crazy yeah. and amazing, but it's going to be so busy. Like the run course is going to be insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a big venue, but yeah, it, it will be busy. Um, I've, got, I've just got some quick quick fire questions uh, for you. First is, sure. what, sh- what shoe are you going to wear for the your next race? So far, the best shoe that I have found is the Saucony, uh, Saucony Endorphin Pro 3. Um, I like the combination of responsive handling with and grip with nice bounce and energy return. Um, you know, I've tried everything, man. I raced with a vapor fly. Don't do that. 
that was stupid. Um, <laughs> the running was great. The rest of it was terrible. Um, I have run in the New Balance Fuel Cell RC Elite V1, which is a nice shoe. But then if you get on certain types of concrete, if it's not, if it's too polished, you like can't get any traction. Um, and I've run in the Sacconi Endorphin Pro 2, which has great grip, but horrendous energy return. So if you're going to get one of the Endorphin Pros, get the three. Okay. All right. What's the toughest thing you've done in sport? In any sport? Yeah. Mm. Man. Uh, when I ran the JFK 50 miler a couple of years ago, I went in with the goal of supporting Mark Gaudet on his run. He was trying to get a top five finish. And so we ran – at the front end of that, I've never run a 50 miler before at this point. We ran at the front end of this race with the leaders for about 25 miles, at which point, uh, and we, this was two weeks after running a marathon too. So I was not doing well physically, uh, at which point my body decided that it was going to reject the race and start cramping. Um, and then I spent the next 25 miles cramping the entire time. Uh, to finish that race that was by far the most miserable race experience I've ever had just out there dragging my crampy legs and I remember getting to mile 37 which is where my wife was supposed to meet me with soup and she was not at mile 37 and I just said ah, I guess we're just gonna so we're just going to have to go on without soup and I'm dragging and I'm cramping and I'm sad and I'm feeling alone and sorry for myself. And then out of the woods at mile 38, my wife comes running, holding a can of soup. And I was like, you brought soup. And I started like <laughs> leaping like uncontrollably. Um, and you can tell like if you're crying in the middle of a race, it's definitely not going great for you. So uh, finishing that event after starting literally running at the speed of, professional ultra marathoners for half of it and then limping in um and i still ended up doing all right i finished 13th i think i beat i beat some guys who are professional ultra runners um and uh yeah it was it was a pretty pretty special experience nice if you're crying over soup, you know it's uh, you know it's yeah. tough, right? <laughs> like actual tears coming down my face. <laughs> we talk, I've talked with a few people on 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 here about like those tough experiences though can can help you for something like high rocks, you know, because oh, it, sure. it it makes it seem relatively easy. You know, I'm I'm not crying over soup yet, so this ain't that bad. You're relatively short is what it definitely can, <laughs> but also like there's different types of pain, right? And your pain tolerance that you have in high rocks is more of this like dull constant exhaustion and burn as opposed to the pain you have at the end of a 50 milers like every step you feel like someone's hitting your quads with a jackhammer because they're so broken down and your knees are swelling so much you feel like they're going to explode and like it's just different yeah, yeah. and if you can get through six hours of that feeling you can get through a lot yeah 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 um, this is this has been great. Just one last question that I uh, I've been asking everyone on the podcast is um, if you could put a message to the world out on a billboard for the whole world to see, what would it say? Um, probably to my wife and daughter, I love you. Thank you for supporting me, and uh, let's go kick some ass. <laughs> Lovely, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. All right, this has been great. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, any other, uh, any final words, any where we should send people on the socials, find out more about your training, so on? Yeah, you can, um, you can check me out. I've got a, I've got a training program on the fitter app. So you can definitely check that out, jump in, get some coaching from me programming. I've got some, some video tips on how to do a lot of the stations. Um, check that out. Check out elevate train at elevate.com. If you're in the DC area, you want to come jump in a workout, even if you're there for a day. Come reach out to me, like put an inquiry on the site, get you into a workout. We'll have some fun. I've done that with a lot of people. And um, of course, uh, don't forget, uh, we have our, my little side project uh, post game. So it is a hard seltzer with seven grams of protein and electrolytes. And uh, it's a great post workout beverage. So um, don't forget to follow drink post game. 
and uh, check it out because we're gonna we're gonna be trying to roll this thing out everywhere as soon as possible. Awesome, awesome! I didn't know about that. That's that's fantastic. All right, brilliant. Thank you, All right, well, thank you for this. Good luck for Chicago, and I will uh, talk to you again soon.